and welcome to our service. If you're new here, you may be wondering who we are and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and his love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into his word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along his path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges, and none of us are perfect. But we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey, because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome. Good morning, West Shore. You are welcome, and it's good to be here with a few that are here physically in the worship center and for those that are worshiping with us online. As we go to sing this first song, I want you to remember that it's very easy for us to say that God is everywhere and that he's wherever we're at. But more specifically, I want you to remember that God is the God of Tampa, Florida. God is the God of our neighborhood and the places that we work and in our homes. God is there, and he has not forsaken us, and he has not forgotten us. So let's sing about that God of this city. God of this city, you're the king of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you God of this city, you're the king of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace. Thank you. 
dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that your plans for us and for our city are great. Father, we know that although it seems we're up against the wall right now, Father, there is nothing that contains you. There is nothing in this world or out of this world that controls you. And Father, we look forward to you busting through our walls of doubt and our walls of faithfulness or faithfulness. And to help us realize that you are here with us. That we're not alone. That you have your arm wrapped around us. And that you're pulling us close. If we'll only allow it. Lord, oftentimes in today's world, we fight against what you want for us. Because we think we know better. Father, help us to realize today that the only thing we truly need to know is you. Father, I pray for Pastor Tim as he continues to lead us in this study of the churches in the book of Revelation. Father, help us to realize that the lessons learned then apply to us today. That as much as the Bible is a book of history, Father, it is a book of living history because you are alive. And Father, help us to take those lessons and apply it to our lives and apply it to our city here. Allow us to realize today that not only are you the God of this city, but that you're the God of our lives as well. Amen. Amen. Father, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. We step back and allow you to step forward because you should be number one. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you, Pastor Jay. It is good to uh, be with you again. Uh, We trust that you are being blessed of the Lord and... um, just letting him guide you and and move through you. A couple things I want to share with you before we go into, into our focused prayer time this morning. I um, want to remind you that we um, our blessing socks are ready, and we've handed out uh, quite a few to different people. Please feel free to uh, stop by the church office, um, give Sharon a call, or... Uh, just let us know you want to pick some up or that you need some, and we'll find a way to deliver them to you. We've got, I think, about 75 of them that we made, and uh, so we're excited to give those out, and uh, quite a few have already been given out. And then I want to remind you um, or let you know, if you did not see in my weekly email, we were blessed by the Florida Baptist Convention. Um, They've been working with some different food organizations, and I got a call from them Friday afternoon, and I was able to go pick up uh, 10 or 12 nice boxes of meal kits, and these meal kits in them have uh, a bag of pre-cooked cut-up chicken and uh, some fresh vegetables, some fresh fruit, some milk, some butter, some cheese, all the things that really you could turn into any different kind of meals, and and a family can uh, have a couple of of meals off of those. We've got them stored in the uh, Fellowship Hall in the refrigerator. They they do need to be refrigerated. Um, But if you are interested, if you or somebody you know, somebody in your community, somebody that is in your family that could use one of these, um, let us know, and uh, we will make arrangements to get those uh, delivered. Um, Like I said, they are perishable, so we need to get these out into the community as soon as possible so that um, they don't go to waste. But it's a a really, really neat opportunity for those that, that may be in need. Um, so that's our uh, couple of things we're, we're mentioning this morning. Then also, don't forget our um, mission project for August, our backpacks. Uh, please keep that in your prayers. Let us know how many you would like to order, and we will we'll be placing the order in a couple of weeks, and we'll get those um, um, to, the, to the school. I'm just thinking now that 
school has been pushed back a little bit. We got a little bit extra time, but but let's go ahead and get this done in August so we can get them in and get them delivered to Tampa Bay Boulevard Elementary so that they can be blessed by those. Um, I do want to mention to you, uh, hopefully you saw either on Facebook or in my uh, weekly email the picture of Mr. Bill Mumford. Um, that was a, uh, a great blessing. I went over Friday to see him, and then yesterday morning his daughter sent me that picture, and he just continues to improve, continues just to astound everybody. And uh, so I, I don't know about you, but that was just a uh, little bit of encouragement for, for me yesterday, yeah, that, that Bill would be doing that well, and he's not going to give up, and, and we know he's not going to give up because he's uh, ornery about certain things, you know, and, and, and you know, he, he, he told his daughter that he, um, he says that things are good here, but they seem to move a little bit slow. He said, you know, I, I call him to come turn my TV off when I'm done with it, and it seems like it takes him two hours to get here, and then it takes him two hours to figure out how to turn it off. So, you know, that's, that's Bill for you. But um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And, and if you are able to uh, send him a card or a letter, he's really enjoying that. And it's real simple to make a visit, um, a window visit to him. You just call him and tell him that uh, you're there. You can just walk around the build building. You go to his window and call him on the phone, and he'll talk your ear off. So, uh, so if you're able to do that, he would, he would greatly appreciate that. So for our focus prayer time, um, this morning, we're going to do a little um, prelude, if you will, to the message, um, and you'll see what I mean when we get into the message, but I've asked Corey to lead us this morning with this thought, that we have been called as followers of Jesus Christ to live in this world, but to not be of this world. Now, this is a very difficult thing for us to do, but I want you to know that it is it has always been a very difficult thing to do. In fact, the first time we see this, if we go all the way back to the Old Testament, we see that the children of Israel were, were told to God, told by God to live in a certain place, and the reason that he told them to live in that place was he wanted them to impact the culture's around them. They didn't do so good. They didn't do good at all. And throughout history, we see that that's what the church has been called to do, and that's what we are being called to do today. And so what the challenge is for us, and as we pray today about this, the challenge for us is to make sure that we have figured out, Christians, and if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, then I would um, naturally have to go to the point that you must say that you believe what the Bible says. And that's what Christianity is based on. So what we have to do is we have to figure out what the Bible says, and then we have to take it and go into the community, go into the culture in which we live, and be a part of that culture without be in the culture without, being a, without turning ourselves over to the culture and looking just like the culture. And I think that's the, the challenge that we have today. So I've asked Corey to come and lead us in our uh, focus prayer. We are glad to have Corey back with us. Uh, Daddy Corey. And uh, if you didn't see on Facebook or Instagram this morning today, little uh, Emmy Ray right, is one month old. And uh, Corey and Katie are just so excited. So it's great to have Corey back with us today. Lead us, please, brother. Before I get started, I'll answer the three questions that I'm sure everyone wants to ask me. Yes, the baby's doing great. Yes, Katie's doing great. And yes, we're getting enough sleep. Just putting it out there. But for real, um, this last month, is uh, it's been kind of crazy. It's been definitely uh, not how you always envision uh, the birth with her coming eight weeks early. Um, but I just want everybody to know uh, Katie and I are so appreciative of your love, your support, and we felt your prayers. We felt God's presence through this whole process, and we just are uh, incredibly grateful for that because she's uh, honestly been kicking butt, and uh, all the doctors keep saying that she has no idea that she was born eight weeks early and that she's progressing just like she was a full-term baby. So just thanks for 
everybody. Uh, Lord, let us pray. Um, Lord, we come to you humbly saying thank you for allowing us to be here today in your house to worship and to um, just hear your word through message and through song, Lord. Um, we live in a crazy time right now. Um, there's a lot going on in the world, Lord. There's a lot going on that is not of you, is not of your word, is not of what the Bible teaches us is true and correct and perfect, Lord. Um, and I just pray that we as Christ followers um, be aware of that and be cognizant of those kind of traps that uh, Satan is setting up for us, Lord, and help us to, you know, be aware of culture, but not let that be the leader of us and our actions and our thoughts and our words and how we live our lives, Lord. Let the Bible be what guides us. Let the Bible be what um, is the things that make us who we are. Um, there's so much going on, Lord, and there's so many, you know, new, crazy, exciting things, actually, that that we're able to do now um, because of what's, you know, technology and just the, the fact of us living in 2020. Um, and Lord, I just pray that we're able to use those things and use, you know, just like what we're doing right now, streaming things on Facebook. I mean, who would have thought 20 years ago we'd be able to online live stream church service, but here we are, um, you know, for better or for worse. Um, but Lord, I just pray that we don't let the things of this world pull us away from the things that make us who we are, make us Christ followers, Lord. The fact that the Bible is God's word, that it is perfect, it is accurate, and it is truth and not just some storybook fairy tale. Lord, uh, let us just always stand firm in the fact that Jesus came down here as a man. He died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood to give us each and every one of us eternal salvation in heaven, Lord, and that he came, he died on the cross and then rose again three days later, Lord. Um, and Lord, there's so much talk these days about, um, you know, with in society and race and all these different things about quote unquote uncomfortable conversations. And Lord, I'm not saying that those definitely need to happen, but I would imagine that those conversations would be a lot more comfortable if we were comfortable having conversations about our faith and about Jesus and about love and about how he would want us to act and treat each other, Lord, because we know that he put himself in crazy situations. He put himself in what at the time was thought of the worst of the worst, the low lives, the criminals, the, the thieves, Lord. Um, but just like we're talking about, he did not let that change him because he was still perfect. He was still without sin, and he was still providing the message of love, salvation, and oneness in our love and following of Jesus Christ, Lord. So I just pray that we're able to allow that to uh, speak to us. We're able to allow that to be our guiding light. And Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us be involved in the culture, be involved in our communities, but let Jesus Christ and our salvation in him be the thing that guides us most often. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, we are in Week three of our series, Dear Church, we are talking about the seven churches that are written to in the first part of the book of Revelation. And as I've said before, I, I know that everybody l desires to have the latter part of the book of Revelation talked about. Because that's the things that movies are made of and, and that everybody wants to just, you know, um, get all hyped up about. The, the apocalyptic things, the end time things, the, the things that, that we, we are looking for. But honestly, my favorite part of the book of Revelation is what we are in the middle of right now. I, I just absolutely love the seven letters that were written to... Um, these churches because they, they tell us exactly what Jesus thought and thinks about the church and what he wants the church, his church, to be. We need to be reminded that scripture refers to the church 
as the bride of Christ. The reason that we are called the bride of Christ is because Jesus started the church and he gave his life for the church. And he has set in place the church as we know it to be his hands and feet in the world in which we live. And it doesn't matter if we lived in the first century A.D. or 2020 A.D. We have been called to be his church, to be his hands and feet. And so when we look at these letters, we are getting a direct message from Jesus as to what he wants us to be. And I was thinking about that this week because... I'm not so sure that we have done, over the years, a really good job of teaching what the Bible says the church should be. I think too many times we have done church, if you will, out of convenience or out of tradition. That word tradition is really a big thing because... Because a lot of churches, to be honest with you, get stuck in tradition. And God help the pastor or the leaders that come to their church and say these fatal words. We want to do things differently. I mean, you are just... In a lot of cases, your tenure is not going to be very long if those words come out of your mouth. Now, I am thankful that, that here at West Shore over the past 17 plus years, not that we haven't had our bumps in the road and, and hills to climb, but, but God has blessed us with um, a group of people who, who truly seek to be the church. And when you truly, be to, when you truly seek to be the church, Guess what? It doesn't matter about tradition. What it matters, what matters is the message of the gospel getting out and reaching the community. And so we come to letter number three, the church at Pergamum. And just a personal note, and, and you'll I'll explain a little bit deeper later on in the in the message, but but this is my favorite of the seven churches. And, and the, there's a, a part of the scripture towards the end of what we're looking at today that um, explains why, but, but this is my favorite, and it's found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. So if you have your Bible handy, or if you were able to print out the outline or, or sign on to you version, um, let's take a look at it this morning. But before we do... Let me explain to you a little bit about Pergamum. Pergamum was a lot like the United States of America. It was in a part of Asia Minor that was extremely affluent. There was a society that was just, I mean, for the time technologically advanced. It was part of the world at that time that just had everything that anybody and everybody wanted. I mean, if you were to take Pergamum and transplant it 2,020 years and place it right where we are today, every child in Pergamum would have an iPhone. Absolutely everyone. They would all have Wi-Fi in their houses. They would all have self-parallel parking cars. That, that's the type of culture that, that they, they were, and that is the culture that we find ourselves in. Now, some would look at our culture today, or the culture of Pergamum, and say, wow, that is really cool. You are so far advanced. You are really blessed. You are really lucky to be living in that age. Others would look at it and say, I'm not so sure you're that lucky to, to live during that, 
that time. Because here is what we have seen throughout history. And if there are any history buffs um, that study history, that history that has not been changed, okay? But if you actually look at history, you, what you will find is that one thing is common amongst very affluent cultures, and this is something that we might want to be warned about, is that all overly affluent cultures eventually implode on themselves. Eventually, that affluence leads to, to such greed and such uh, narcissism that, that those cultures implode on themselves, and that's what we see in Pergamum. And so Jesus writes to the church at Pergamum. He says, Dear Pergamum, you are an affluent city. This is what I know about you. And here's what the, the, the problem is. And I'm talking about Pergamum, but I'm also talking about the Roman Empire, and I'm talking about the United States. Affluence leads people to do something that is not of God. Affluence leads people to depend upon themselves instead of God. Think about it in our culture. We hear more about economic things, more about lifestyle things, more about convenience things than we do about spiritual things. And the reason that is is because we have gotten to a place that we are so affluent that we depend upon ourselves instead, upon, instead of depending upon God. And, and that's what happened in Pergamum. And what happens when that, a culture moves in that direction is Satan is able to use these things to weasel his way in and set up shop in the middle of that culture. And we're going to see in just a minute by looking at the scripture that that's what happened in Pergamum. And I think it's fair to say that Satan has set up shop in 2020 in our world. So, this letter like the rest of them, although penned by the Apostle John while he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos, although it was penned by him, it was written by Jesus himself. It was written by our Lord and Savior directly to the church at Pergamum and directly to, by extension, to us. So I want to start at Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And then we're going to move out of Revelation just for a second and look at the book of Hebrews because there's a connection there that, that God gives us an understanding of who we're talking about here and who actually wrote this book. Okay, so, so track with me. Verse 12, first of all, says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp, two-edged sword. What in the world? Does that mean? Is he talking about some warrior, some, some, uh, some guy riding in on a white horse? What is he talking about? He says, this is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Okay, so let's, let's just put our fingers right there, and let's move to the book of Hebrews, and let's, let's find a connection here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest, what? Two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So we see the two-edged sword talked about in Revelation and in Hebrews. If you look at the first line of Hebrews, it says that the word of God is the two-edged sword that we're referring to. Okay? Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, the book of John... Chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word? The Word is Jesus. 
the word is this two-edged sword. So who is the two-edged sword? Jesus. That was almost like a math equation. And I don't like math. But, but see, what he's saying is that Jesus is the word, and Jesus is the one who wrote this letter and the other six letters to the churches. So, what I want you to think about as we study this, as we continue to study this, is that Jesus has written you a letter. If you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are part of his church, and Jesus has said, I have written you a letter. And so it's directly to us. Yes, it was written to the church at Pergamum, but this is what is so cool about the Bible. This is why, for centuries, cultures have tried to get rid of the Bible. Because it has the ability to transcend time. It has the ability to be written 2,000 years ago and yet still apply itself to us today. It is why the Bible, still to this day, is the number one bestseller of all time. And yet it is the number one book that has tried to be destroyed. Did you get that? It's the number one bestseller of all time, and yet no other book has tried to be destroyed like the Bible has. And yet it can't be destroyed. Because this is not just another book that you find on the shelves of a library, if they still have books in libraries. They're all just computers now. It is the Word of God. And so what we have is a message, folks, directly to us from our Lord and Savior. And so this message to the church at Pergamum is very simply this. He says that the message to the church is that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That's what Corey prayed about just a little bit ago. We are to be in this world. You are to live and move and breathe and work and raise a family and be part of the culture and yet be so much part of Jesus that you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And as I said before, this is one of the most difficult things for us to accomplish and I don't understand why this is the way it is. I used to say this about when I was in youth ministry, is that some, for some reason, for the majority of Christians, when we get in the world, instead of us being the salt that permeates the rest of the world, the culture begins to influence us. And so we have to be very careful with this. And so what I want us to talk about today and what this um, letter is telling us is how to be in the world and yet not be of the world. It is possible. We can do this. We have the technology. We can rebuild ourselves. I'm dating myself. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. A lot of times I have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's look at five or six things that will allow us to be in the world and not of the world. And so number one is this. While we are in the world, we are to remain faithful. What scripture is telling us is that while we are out, out there working and moving and breathing and raising a family and, and, and doing the things that we call life, we must remain faithful to the Word of God. And verse 13 just really just hits you right in the face like you, like you walked outside at 6 o'clock on an August morning in Florida and the humidity was so thick that it just knocked you over. 
If you don't know what that's like, if you're in Florida, if you're in Tampa, just get up tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock and walk outside and you'll see what I mean. Verse 13. Here's what Jesus says to the church at Pergamum. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan City. As I said, affluence opens the door. It cracks the door for Satan to get in. And what Jesus is saying is that when, when we are living in that type of culture, folks, he needs us to remain faithful. When Satan is in the middle of the culture, he needs his church to remain faithful, to remain loyal. I want to look at this phrase for just a second. He says, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. I am concerned that Satan has set up his throne in about 50 states. And he is working like crazy to gain control. I debated whether to go here or not. But the Spirit has told me... When you have cities where it is okay for casinos to be open, but churches to be closed, Satan has set up his throne. Satan has set up his throne. Not that I'm saying that, that as followers of, of Christ, we should not be prudent, we should not be cautious, we should not take every precaution to, to keep people safe, but when we see that the seed of Satan takes precedent over the church, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Satan has set up his throne. And, and so what Jesus is saying is that, folks, you're going to live in cultures like this. But here, here's the encouraging part. Okay, And I want you to listen to this because my thinking is this. Whenever the church has been squashed, Whenever it has, whenever culture has attempted to put a lid on the church, guess what happens? The church explodes with growth. So in essence, we are, we are possibly looking at a time when the church begins to grow. I mean, it, it's just like when you were a kid. If your parents told you not to do something, what did you do? Exactly what they told you not to do. So if Satan tells us to sit down and shut up and put, tries to put the lid on us, it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to, to, to rise up and say, just like that t-shirt that we've seen around, not today, Satan. Not today, Satan. And so Jesus says, remain faithful while you're in the world. Don't deny me. Stand firm. Stand strong. And folks, that's what we're being called to do. Secondly, while in the world, he tells us to watch our step. Watch your step while you're in the world. Chapter 2, verse 14, the first part of it. Okay, so remember what Jesus does in this. He, he talks about the positive things of the church. But then he, he doesn't hold anything back. He says, okay, this is what I am happy about. This church here, he says, you have remained loyal. However, however, I, got, I do have some things I need to talk to you about. And so he says, but I have a few complaints against you. Notice how Jesus didn't sugarcoat anything. He didn't say, there's some ministries that I want you to work on a little bit. He didn't say that. He said, okay, here's a good point, but I got some complaints. He says, I got a problem with you people, and I'm going to tell you what it is. He said, I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is that 
is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. Now, the story of Balaam and Balak in the, in the book of Numbers is a really neat story, and I, I encourage you to go back and, and read it. Um, if you haven't ever read it or if you've forgotten about it, you'll get a kick out of it because it's all about a talking donkey. Okay, So, so go back and look at that. But, but what, what Jesus is saying is that we need to watch our step because just like in the story of Balaam and Balak, there are things that tripped up the children of Israel, and there are things, if we let them, will trip us up in our walk with Christ. There are things that if we allow into our eyes and into our ears, they get into our brain, and when something gets in our brain, it starts to seep down into our heart. And so he says, you've got to be careful. He says, be on guard. Satan wants to trip us up because if he, he knows that if he can trip us up, he can get us to fall. And if we fall, the whole culture is shot. You see, Jesus referred to the church as salt and light. And there's a reason that he did that. Now, in our culture, we, we, we like salt because we like, we like to add the flavor. I mean, a lot of flavor, right? But, but what Jesus was talking about was the fact that salt was used to preserve meat. And the way that they would preserve meat with salt is that the salt would be spread out over the meat and it would soak in and it would permeate all of the meat. And that is what we have been called to do as followers of Jesus Christ, to be sure of our steps, to be in this culture, but not of this culture, and to permeate the culture. Imagine. If at every workplace, the most trusted, the most faithful, the most honest, the most incredible people of integrity were followers of Jesus, how different that workplace would be. But he says, watch out. Because Satan wants to trip us up. He wants to make us fall so that we lose our testimony. We lose our witness. And people look at us and say, well, why would I want to be a Christian? Why would I want to be a follower of Jesus? They are no different than I am. In fact, some people would say in some contexts, they know some people who aren't Christians that are better people than the people that are Christians. What a sad testimony. What a sad statement that is. So he says, while we're in the world, watch your step. And thirdly, he continues and says, while you're in the world, resist false teaching. The second half of verse 14 and continuing through 16, he continues to talk about this story of uh, Balaam and Balak. He says, he taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolotans, we talked about those a couple of weeks ago, among you, among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So what he is saying here is that he is giving them a word of caution, and he's giving us a word of warning to watch out for false teaching that creeps in to the teaching of God. And this has happened throughout the centuries, and we still see it happening today, where the gospel is diluted, where the truth of who Jesus is is diluted, where we have churches that will teach that, you know what, you can be a part of those things in the world. It's okay because Jesus has saved you. Well, here's the reality of it. Not being a part of those things doesn't save you. Jesus saved you, and once he has saved you, then that is when you turn from those things and you become a totally different person. And that's what he's called us to do. But this, what he's referring to with the, with the church at Pergamum <laughs> is that they have allowed some of this stuff into the church. And they've allowed some practices in the church 
that I can only explain it one way. They are simply not of God. And so what he is saying is that we need to be on guard about this type of false teaching and do not let it get into our lives. Stay on guard. Stay true to the word. Several years ago, 20 years ago, um, when I left my secular job and went and started teaching, I had to go back and add some classes to my degree that would be, uh, would allow me to be state certified to teach. And one of the things that I had to do was I had to pass the state education test for a dreaded subject of Satan called math. Now, here's the deal. Math is difficult enough when you're in school and you're doing it, but when you've been out of school for 15 or 20 years and you have to go back and take it again, it's, the, it's like a different language, right? You know, it's like the guy that said, I was fine with math until the alphabet got involved. And, and that's the truth. Um, but here's the deal. That's what happens to us with the Word of God. When we do not constantly spend time in the Word of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, then it becomes like a foreign language to us. I mean, when was the last time you heard the names Balaam and Balak? Well, they're right there in the book of Revelation. You don't have to go back to the book of Numbers to read it. But see, what happens is when we remove ourselves from the Word, it becomes like the math that we took in high school, that we struggled to get through in high school, and we have no idea. Thankfully, I had a dear friend who was a teacher that was a math teacher, and she tutored me in my mid-30s to pass the math exam. But you see what I'm getting at is that we have got to stay true to the Word of God. We have got to stay devoted to it. We have got to stay on top of it every single day. Because you know what? The Word has something new for us every single day. No matter how many times you read a passage, it will speak to you in a different way because it is the eternal Word of God. So be careful of the, 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 the false teaching. One final thing about that is that Scripture tells us to be careful about false teaching. Specifically, it says to be careful because in the last days there will be false teachers that are only concerned about the tickling of ears. What that means is there will be, there will be teachers and preachers that all they want to do is tell people what they want to hear. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you what. As followers of Jesus Christ, at some point, we just simply have to say enough is enough and call sin what it is, sin. Two more. While in the world, we should remember Jesus' promise. Verse 17, first part says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. Okay, so he is talking to the church, but he makes another reference now to the Old Testament. Now, now this is very key because when he makes these references to the Old Testament and to the children of Israel, what he is saying is, this stuff was first meant for my chosen people, the children of Israel, but they rejected it, and so now I have made it available to my church. And so he says, to those who are victorious, to the churches 
that, that are my churches, my bride, to everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. Now, if you're not familiar with um, biblical terms, you're probably wondering, what in the world is this stuff, manna, that he is talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were wandering in the desert because of their sin, and they had nothing to eat and nothing to drink, God provided for them. He sent this stuff called manna from heaven, and it would fall every night, and they would get up in the morning, and their instructions were to go out and pick up enough for their family for that day, only for that day. If they tried to get too much, it would spoil. It would turn rancid because they didn't follow what God told them to do. And the reason that he did it that way was he wanted them to understand that they were dependent upon him and him alone. And that is what he wants us to be reminded of. But this manna that he's talking about here is so much more than just a physical food. It's so much more than just sustenance that we need every day. What he is talking about here, he says, I'm going to give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. He is talking about spiritual nourishment. He is talking about the reward of a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. He says, I got a promise for you. He said, I'm not like some of those people you know in your life that make promises and don't keep them. He says, I am a promise keeper. And I make a promise and I keep it. And he says, I am going to give you some of this spiritual nourishment that will just make you, just make you understand how good and loving I am. And folks, here's, here's what, we got one more, but I just want to just park here for a minute because in this culture that we're talking about, we're talking about Pergamum and we're talking about our culture today. We think that the, the blessings are found in economic and material things. But the true blessings of God are found in this spiritual manna that he's talking about. We're talking about things that you cannot explain to other people unless they have truly been there and been blessed by God. That is the type of manna that he is talking about. The, the type of feeling, the type of emotion, the type of, 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 of foundation that's just hard to understand. And that's what his promise is for us. That when the whole world is falling apart, when everything seems like it's spinning out of control, we can stand firm and say, it's okay, because God is in control. My God is in control. All right, and then finally, while we're in the world, nurture your relationship with Jesus. Now, I said that this is my favorite letter, and it's because of this last point. If you've ever had me minister to you, or your family at the time of a death and a memorial service or a funeral is needed. I use Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. Because we are called while we're in this world to nurture our relationship with Jesus. Because there is nothing more important to Jesus than our relationship with him. He desires it so much. He desires it right now. And he wants us to nurture that relationship, but he's got something special planned for us. You see, he, he is so concerned about our relationship that he says this. And I will give to each one a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Let me tell you what he's talking about here. He wants us to nurture our relationship here because we are preparing for eternity. And when we leave this life, when we either draw our last breath or when Jesus comes back for his church, he says this relationship that, that we've been nurturing is just going to explode with so many wonderful things. And he says, here's what I mean. He says, for those who have given their life to me, 
who are followers of mine, I got this special thing in heaven for you. He said, I got, I got all these white stones. And he said, when you get there, I'm going to go back to the special place that I have for you, and I'm going to pull out this white stone. And on that stone, there's going to be a name written. And it's your name. But it's not the name that you were given on earth. It's the name that I have given you in heaven. And only him and you will know that name. Because he has such a need and a desire for that special relationship that it's only you and he that know it. Now the only way we can describe this in earthly terms, is is there somebody in your life, a parent, a child, a spouse, that you have a special name for? I'm not talking about those types of names. I'm talking about something that's endearing, okay, something that's loving, something that only the two of you share. That's a special relationship, right? That's something special and dear between the two of you. And that is what Jesus has waiting for us. He says to the church at Pergamum, this white stone, you people, you're going to have a special name written on it, and that's the name I'm going to call you by. And our relationship is going to be so wonderful that you just can't imagine it. And so what he is saying is, folks, we are to live in this world but not be of this world because we are preparing for the next world, for the next life. And it is going to be something that we just can't imagine. So the letter to the church at Pergamum says, stay loyal, stay true to my word, nurture your relationship, and prepare for what I've got planned for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this letter, this incredible love letter that you have written to the church at Pergamum and that you have written to us. It's incredible, Lord, and we thank you for it. And we just pray that you will help us to live up to what you've called us to be in this letter, that we will be children of salt and light, that we will permeate the culture that we live in, that will not be led by the things of Satan in this world, but that we will be led by the Word of God, the inerrant, eternal Word of God, the Word that changes lives and changes hearts and and redeems marriages and, and restores relationships. Because that's what you're all about, Father, is those relationships. We thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. God's not done with us. He's not done with the church. And we're going to sing in just a second about him not being done with the city. And I want you to know this morning that he is not done with you. And so if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never turned everything over to him, we want to encourage you today to make that decision. And if you are a follower of Jesus, but you have heard about this church at Pergamum, and you're like, wow, that kind of describes my life. And I need to get some things right. If that is you, we want to challenge you. We want to encourage you today to make that decision. Whatever your decision is, as always, I would encourage you to email me, Pastor Tim at westshorebaptist.org. And I would love to have a conversation with you. But we're going to sing right now about God not being done with the city. Because he is not done. He's got work to do. Let's sing. Pastor Terry.
You know, when we remember what he has done, we can be confident that he's not done with us yet. Amen. It's so good to have you with us this morning. Corey, come and dismiss us with prayer. May God bless you today. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you saying thank you again for allowing us um, to hear this message, um, either online or in person. Lord, we just... We thank you so much for all of your blessings, Lord, and just pray that this, this, the songs we sang today and the words that we, that we heard were not uh, just in one ear and out the other, Lord, that we don't just go out into the world and not use them and not let them impact our lives, Lord. I pray that, as we've said over and over again this morning, Lord, help us to be in the culture but not of the culture, Lord, unless that culture is of Jesus Christ and the word of our Savior. Um, in the Bible, Lord. So I just pray that we allow that to uh, just impact us, Lord. And as we just sang, I pray that we just remember the words that, you know, that no matter how dark the days are, let us remember the empty grave, Lord, because no matter how, how difficult things may be, no matter how much we struggle, no matter how much we, you know, face difficult times, there's always the the saving grace of Jesus Christ who gives us eternal salvation in heaven with him, Lord. We thank you again. Be with each and every one of us. Keep us safe. Keep us protected. I pray for our country. I pray for our community. I pray for all of our leaders and pray for each and every one of us as individuals. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.